as usual, as always, get to come and get to see good to see some of my friends here and those online. I know it's always different when you got like some people here and then you got people are watching online. But I'm just thankful that we can continue just to to do this, to continue to speak, to continue to share, to continue to just have fellowship with one another and just stir one another up in the word and get into the Bible. So if you do have your Bible, I just want to jump in to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And I'm just going to, we're going to jump into this and um, I'm going to just read just the initial part of this and I'm going to pray and I might reference some other scriptures as well here. But the, the title for tonight's message is the four soils of the heart. The four soils of the heart. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. On that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him. So that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root and withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, I thank you again for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are just a God that pursues us, God. You are constantly speaking and moving and pursuing us. I thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you are, you, you want us not to be those that, there's so much more to what our current experience is, God. There's so much more that you're after from our hearts and in our hearts, God. And we're here tonight just to, to go further, to go deeper. We want you just to awaken that, that hunger and that longing for more of you, God, that we would hear, have ears to hear what you're speaking, even right now, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm, again, I'm, I'm excited. I had the privilege yesterday of officiating a, a marriage uh, for my wife's cousin out in southwest Austin in the Texas heat outside. That was fun about this time yesterday, a little bit earlier. But it was uh, definitely hot. If you've ever tried to um, deliver a message or to conduct a ceremony of any sort, 90-degree weather in a, in a suit, I advise you not to. No, I'm just kidding. Now, I was very honored and privileged to, to be able to do that, and I have just been encouraged, and when pastor asked me to teach tonight, I had a few different things I wanted to, to cover, and so I, I'm, just, I'm just really just trying to be sensitive to the Lord and just spend just, just a few moments here with you guys, but I just really want him just to speak and have his way. Sometimes I just get before, before everybody, and I'm just like, Lord, I have preparation, I have notes, I have outline, but... I, more than anything, I just want you to speak and have your, that you would, there would be unction that you would speak through me in a way that I can't prepare for on my own. I just want my heart to be ready for that. So hopefully you guys can have, be at that same posture uh, just joining in with me. So Jesus, here in this parable here, so Jesus is actually, in Matthew 13, if you actually, if you've ever looked at some of the studies here in Matthew chapter 13, there's, Jesus actually begins a, a series of parables. And there's actually seven that he tells in a row. Uh, four of them he tells publicly, and then three of them he gives just personally to his disciples. These are known as like the, the, the kingdom parables, where Jesus is actually telling, giving instructions, and giving them ideals and principles related to what the kingdom of God is like. And at this time in Jesus' ministry, many, as you... As we read in, in the first few verses, many are gathering to him. Many are following him, thousands upon thousands. Some are coming for healing. Some are coming for food. Some are coming, I mean, food. I mean, think about it. If you hear about some dude 
multiplying a few loaves of bread and some fish and feeding thousands of people free food, I'm, I'm there. I'm going. Come on. That's like, you know, I, this, that's, that's, that's the kind of people that Jesus, in the, this time in his ministry, people are just hearing about these things. They're hearing about these miracles, and they're, just, they're flocking to him in that way. Some are coming to criticize, and some are just coming out of curiosity. Yet only a few you see at the end where Jesus, after Jesus is resurrected and ascended, there's only a few left with him and left waiting in the upper room, waiting and obeying what Jesus told him to do, to wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Only 120 to be exact. But yet thousands upon thousands heard this, the message of the, of the gospel of the kingdom. They, thousands upon thousands were around all these, when all these things were going around. And Jesus probably taught and spoke to thousands and upon thousands. I mean, I don't know the exact number, but, I mean, he fed approximately 15,000 people at one sitting. So imagine how many more people. That was just one time. So imagine how many thousands upon thousands of people he encountered. Yet only a few remained at the end before the church had its, at its beginning. And I believe today, uh, I mean, similarly, I think today we have many Christians who come to church and gather for many different reasons. Some come, you know, for healing. Some come for because they are in a difficult time in their life and they need, they need help. They need support. And th these are all valid and amazing things that people would have opportunities to come to the Lord. And, but we all come to the to church, or we come to hear the, the word of the kingdom, we come to, the go to hear the gospel, we come to gather as Christians for many different reasons, but, only, but our res it's our response that is different. Everybody's response can vary. And that's what Jesus get, begins to tell these, par these parables, and specifically, this is the parable of the sower, where he tells and he gives us four different heart responses. He, he outlines and says these are four different Responses people have to my words. And this is the thing is that as we might be all, we all come for different reasons. We all hear the gospel message. But as time goes on, as trouble comes, as earthly success comes, some of us turn away from his leadership and go about our own business. Some of us, you know, we hit a little bump in the road and we're, we're done. Or some of us, I mean, it's, we all have different, we have different responses. And it's based on how we respond to the word of the kingdom. And what is our, what, and what is, we, we can place ourselves in some of these different categories that Jesus points out here. Studies show that, I mean, even many young Christians turn away from the Lord and disconnect from church either permanently or for an extended period of time after the age of 15. And I, I, that, that pains my heart. And that really, you know, if you hear this a lot, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, the people, you know, that, the, I don't want to be associated with the religious. You know, I don't want to be a religious. And that's, that's, Jesus didn't want to either. <laughs> Being associated with uh, those who were forced, forced something that, you know, that's what, that's what when, we, when we talk about religion in that context, it means to be forced something at a young age and then to be asked to follow it when, by people who didn't walk it out. <laughs> that, is what, that is what it means to be burned out and, burnt and turned away from, from God because of religion. Because it's when you're forced something in a way and by people who didn't, and they are calling you to do the same, but they're not willing to walk it out themselves. And that, that turns away people from the Lord. That turns people away from one. Hey, what you're following is not, if, if you're not willing to do it yourselves, then why should I? And that's when we talk about Having a religious spirit, that's, in a nutshell, that's part of it. And Jesus is, think of it, Jesus is, is, is speaking to multitudes of all these different categories. He, the Pharisees are there, the religious crowd is there, the, the, the poor, the rich, the woman, the child, the, the businessman, the, the, the tax collectors, you know, the... the those all in different areas of of society, Jesus is speaking to the families, the young and old. All these religious leaders at this time are, you know, they they've already publicly declared their animosity toward toward Jesus 
And because of their rejection of him, Jesus began to teach in these parables. Because, because of this rejection, he began to con- teach in parables that concealed new truths about the kingdom from those whose hearts were hardened against God. And that's, a parable is simply a story, right? We understand that. A parable is a story. Jesus told stories. And Jesus told these stories both to reveal and conceal truth. He, he spoke in these mysteries, as you, as you might look at them, because he wanted to reveal truth to those who were actually after it, and he wanted to conceal truth from those who, who had already rejected him. So that's why he spoke in parables. It's, it's, it was a way for him to communicate deep truths and real truths about his kingdom and what his kingdom is like and who he is. But Jesus isn't after a casual observer. He didn't want just casual observers. He was after hearts that were loyal and fully committed to following him. And how do you do that? You, how do you weed through the crowds? How do you weed through the crowds of people who are, are there for multitudes of reasons? And he began to speak in this way because he is always, what, what moves his heart, what always has moved God's heart is our hearts that are, are hungry for him in return. That are hungry for him. And Think, I mean, I, uh, those who have little children, um, I know my children like uh, when I chase them around the house, right? I don't know if any of your children have you had the same experience. My children love when I, if I put attention on them and I chase them around the house. You know, even if I'm trying to tickle them and they don't, they're like, no, I don't want you to tickle me. But yet, they're like, chase me, chase me. Chase. They, they want it, but they don't kind of thing. And that, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. I just kind of, I'm a, I like to just observe. I'm a pretty, I call myself just a professional observer. I just observe a lot of different things and behaviors. I'm not a psychiatrist or anything, but I just get astonished by certain simple things in life. And I'm, 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 I begin to question, ask the questions, wow, God, is this, is this what you do for us? Is that, that you know, when we, when you chase after us, and you're chasing after us, and you want that same kind of response. Because just like a child, my, chi- my children just, they, they get so moved when they, my attention is on them. And they get so full of joy and excitement. And they're running away from me at the same time, but they want me to, they, they, they love being pursued. In the same way, God wants us to know that he's pursuing us. In that same way, and he's after those hearts that are, that are responding to him that are responding to his pursuit of us, that are, that are excited about his pursuit of us, that see it and, and respond to it in a certain way, that moves him as, our, as, as, as he is our father. Jesus emphasized that truth is not neutral. It either hardens or softens those who are exposed to it. Jesus, truth is truth, is truth. But for some, for the, for the person who has already rejected him in their heart, the Bible says in Romans, Paul says to the Roman church that they, uh, those, they suppress, these are those who suppress the truth. Though they know, being, being those who are aware that uh, God exists and, and from their heart, you know, knowing that they have a conscience, they see creation, they, they willingly suppress these things. They suppress the truth. Anytime they hear anything related to the truth, it's, it, their hearts have been hardened. They harden themselves against it. But for some, the truth, they, are, they, they love the truth. They want the truth, even if it hurts sometimes. Even if it isn't what they want to hear. That's what it means to have a love for the truth, is, is, to, is to receive it even if you don't like it. Even if it hurts. To be receptive. So the first response is the wayside response. The wayside response. These are the hearers of the word of the kingdom who stay at a distance and never truly understand what they hear. It's not that they don't understand because of their intelligence, but they don't really want to understand. They aren't receptive to the word because they aren't willing to receive it. They are content to stand off on the outer edges of a religious system and be recognized as as a good person, but they aren't willing to come to the man, Christ Jesus. 
They aren't willing to exchange their, their own robes for his robes, their, his, their own righteousness their, that is as filthy rags for his righteousness. They aren't willing to leave behind their pride, their reputation, their possessions, or their pleasures to take the time and plant the seed because they don't see the value of the seed. It's a wayside. It's a casual thing. The seed falls by the wayside. The sower sows some seed and it falls by the wayside and it says the birds came and devoured them. And I believe as a church, we have recognized this response. We recognize that some people... Some people's response to the gospel is this casual, like, oh, I don't really fully want to, I, I kind of like what you're, what, what you're doing, but I don't really want to commit. It's kind of this halfway wayside response. And the church has recognized this, but instead of faithfully sowing the same seed and creating the right environment, we change the seed. We change the seed, and what we've done is we've created a wayside culture, making it harder for people to have a genuine conversion experience and leaving them vulnerable to deception. We change the seed. The seed, Jesus tells us the seed is the word of God. The seed is the message of the word of the kingdom. It's the word of God. And we change the seed to make it more receivable or palatable because we recognize people aren't fully buying into it and because, because that's the response. We want it. We, we try to get more people, so we change it. That's, in my understanding, that is a very wrong response to how we should, we should never change the seed. We should, rather, we should under, fully get the right seed and continue to, to release the right seed, and we should rather focus on creating the right environment for the seed to grow rather than trying to shift. We drop a little bit of word or truth on the wayside, but it's not the full truth or the main focus. You know, if you've ever been to a, I mean, I, like I said, I, was at a, I did a wedding yesterday. And sometimes if you've been to a lot of weddings, sometimes it's, it's supposed to be a, you know, a marriage, a Christian union and a marriage ceremony, you know, conducted before God. And sometimes God is just not even hardly mentioned in a marriage ceremony. It's like we might say, we might say that a few token scriptures, but then it's, then it's not about that him anymore. He, it's just a little bit of truth by the wayside. <laughs> it's just a little bit, enough to just say that it, we fulfilled our duty, but it was, we don't want to ruffle too many people's feathers by, by saying what, what, we, what it really is all about. What it really is all about. <laughs> that is what it means to, to, that's how we water down the message a lot of times. And that creates it, that causes it to have little, little effect. And out of fear of being unpopular, we try to stay as close as possible to what society accepts as normal than what God accepts as normal. We might feel relevant or progressive for a moment, but when moving forward becomes moving away from God, we've lost our way. Like, I, I'm all about, you know, being with the times and, you know, being, you know, Engaging with culture in every way we can. I'm all about that. I love that. I think the church needs to be in the highways and the byways. The church needs to be in, in the culture, in every sphere of society. But the seed needs to remain the same. We need to, we need to get the pure seed out there. <laughs> and we can do it. And we, It just has to come from a heart of, of compassion and tenderness. It doesn't mean we shove it down people's throat. We come with a, a, from a posture of humility and love and kindness. That's how we spread the seed. But we don't change the seed. If we're called to be Christians and we're called to follow Jesus and spread the word of the kingdom, and you like, if I say, if I say the word of the kingdom is a, is a apple seed, but I'm out here spreading uh, cucumber seeds, what do you think I'm, what's, what's going to happen? I mean, it, what, do we wonder why the, the American Christianity expression doesn't always look like the Bible expression of Christianity? It's because we, could it be that we've been planting the wrong seed? We've been preaching the wrong seed. That's also what we do just for a little, I'm learning as a parent. I think a lot of times as parents, I want my kids to like me, right? I don't want to always be the bad guy. I don't always want to tell them the things that they, that, 
they need to hear but they don't want to hear. I don't always want to be that guy. And so I, the temptation is to not tell them the things that they need to hear and to just try to be their friends and try to be, you know, just make them happy. But that's, that's the, also the greatest danger as a parent because then I'm feeding them something that is not really the truth. And I'm causing, I'm creating an environment where truth can't really grow in their life and change can't really happen. Does that make, does that make sense? That, I, I, I think about that and it, it just it hits me. The, the next response is that, is that rocky response where, where the word falls, the seed falls on the stony ground. And these are those who hear the word, understand the word, but they don't obey the word. They understand it. Like the, first, the, the wayside response is those who don't want to un- fully understand it. They don't want to fully get into it and receive it. But these are those who do receive it, but they uh, aren't willing to obey it. They aren't willing to do it. They actually receive the word with joy, but later dry up when trouble or persecution comes because they have no depth of soil. It's not, hear this, it's not merely the, per, the profession of, a, of faith, but perseverance of faith that, ter, that determines our authenticity. Many start with enthusiasm, but if we never put forth the effort to change the way we think, speak, and act, if we don't take the time to cultivate a root system of prayer and obedience before our Father, if we don't seek to know Him in the secret place, then when the drought comes, when the heat comes, when the trouble comes, when pressure comes, we wither away. It's seed that fall has fallen on stony ground. We've not allowed that seed to take depth. And when we respond, when we hear the word of the kingdom, we don't actually apply it to our lives. We don't do it. We don't obey it. What it means to have root, he says in verse 6, but when the sun was up, they were scorched because they, were, they had no root and they withered away. Another uh, telling of this, I think in Mark, in Mark or Luke, talks about having no moisture either. And so roots, when you understand roots, right, roots are beneath the surface of, a, of any plant or tree. I mean, sometimes you see a little roots above the ground, but mostly roots are, are beneath the surface. It's the things you choose to do when nobody else is watching. That's what builds strength and endurance when the drought comes, when the heat comes, when trouble comes, when persecution and difficulty comes. That's what's going to get you through. It's not that you attended church once a week. It's what, what did you do beneath the surface when no one else was watching? Did you cultivate moisture? The, when I say moisture, beneath the, beneath the ground, that's, that's why roots grow beneath, are beneath the ground because that's where they absorb the moisture to feed the tree, to feed the plant, to draw it in. And that's, that's the same way, the moisture being the living water, the presence of the Lord. The Bible gives a picture of, the, of, the, of being trees planted by streams of living water. Revelation also tells of it. Jeremiah tells of it. David, the psalmist tells of it. Psalm chapter 1. Those who are willing to delight in the word of God, who, who obey, and again, when no one else is watching, who seek his presence in his face when no one else is there. That is where the depth comes from. So are we, are, look at your own individual response to to, to the gospel in that way and to the word of the kingdom, but also look at the environment you're creating for others. I want, I want to create that environment where we, 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 value the, we value not just, again, just having seeds sown, having the word preached on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or hearing the word or, or getting in the, in the Bible, but not ever actually ever putting effort to walk it out in the secret. Radical Christianity, know this, this, I'm, I am so convicted of this and, and challenged by this, but radical and true authentic Christianity is not how high you can jump or how loud you can shout in a service or at a conference, but it's how you live when no one else is watching for decades. That is radical to me. I, when, I, when I see uh, followers of Jesus who have been following him faithfully for decades, those are my heroes. <laughs> It's not the person who, who just had this radical experience at a conference and comes back and is all excited about the Lord, and a few weeks later, it's, it's not there. It's, it's gone. You know, that's, that's not being radical. 
going on a missions trip, that's amazing, that's awesome. But you go on a missions trip for, for a week or two, come back, and you go back to your, your life and you don't have any desire to be faithful to the Lord from there, that's not radical. That's, that, is, that is religion and religious, having a religious attitude and spirit. <clears throat> Think about the excitement that comes with the birth of a child. And then imagine what would happen if you only interacted with the child once a week. We need to diligently build life on life praying communities where new, our newborns can be weaned, strengthened, and equipped. Imagine that. Like this is, what, this is how we think church, a lot of times in America, this is how we think church should be, right? We want people to come to the altar, make a decision to follow Jesus, to turn their life to the Lord. That's, that's amazing. I don't diminish that. But then there's no interaction. There's no growth. The church can be referred to a lot of times as the mother where that, hold, that holds the newborns. That As we are born again into the kingdom, the church, it's through the church. And if the church pays no attention to the newborns, rather we push away the newborns because to be frank, newborns can be disruptive, right? <laughs> well, you, I mean, I'm about to have, my wife's about to have our fourth child and, <laughs> oh my gosh, five weeks. So is Pastor Braden over there. He's going, to fi- he's going on five though, so that's, that's next level. That's a whole nother level. But newborns, you, you know when you have a newborn, Right, your life has to change. Like you can't just go business as usual. Like I, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what, how to adjust from Josiah, my third. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. But your life has to. You rearrange your life to support that newborn, to to raise them, to wean them, to teach them, to to help them grow. And then they even as toddlers and children, and as they grow, it takes r- real effort, right? It's more than just making the baby and then just letting it happen. I mean, it's more, I mean, and then, and, and then just, okay, I'll see you in 16 years. Like, I mean, that's, that, that the church has to somehow come to a place of repentance on this issue and take responsibi- more responsibility for these newborns. We want the gospel to be preached. We want the right seed to be sown. And then, but also we want the environment to be one that is where the soil is prepared. It's moist because we have a lifestyle in the community of prayer and we, where we're teaching, where, where, where we value discipleship. We value what happens Monday through Saturday, not just Sunday. We value what happens in each other's lives on the day in and day out. We want to grow on life on life. And reach and working with each other to reach com- our community. There's more in, that goes into it than just having a good Sunday altar call. Though that is very much I love I love those things. It's more. The third response was the th- just to quickly highlight it is the thorny response. The thorny response. The seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. What, is, what does that mean? It is the seed that is sown in a very difficult environment. These are those who hear the word, understand the word, but they also hold on to wrong mindsets that are contrary to what Jesus taught. We have surrounded ourselves with worldly, worldly definitions of things like happiness, success, Love, beauty, comfort, pleasure, money. Therefore, the cares we have for these things choke the life out of us and prevent us from producing real fruit. It's, it's the issue of, again, we live in this Americanized culture where, you know, again, there are all sorts of distorted definitions of things like success, right? S- Jesus said success is to be, a, a, to be meek, to be a servant. To be faithful, Our, but but six, and, and even it, it it had nothing really to do with money, though money is appreciated. There was never no, anything to do. Is is rather how much are you willing to give of yourself? That is how he defines success. Are you willing to go low? Are you willing to choose humility? Are you willing to to serve the least of these? Are you willing to love 
God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yet in America, we have a very different definition of success. We have to have the latest things. We have to have the most things. We have to uh, look a certain way, right? We have to appear a certain way. We have to have the right uh, uh, appearance on social media. We have to uh, have the, uh, enough reputation. There's all these other things in, in you know, what it means to be beautiful. What, you know, for, I mean, it's more for, that's more for women. I think most guys, most guys don't care. <laughs> but we have all these different definitions. But, but at the same time, it's about, we, it's about when we come into the kingdom of God, we hear the word of the kingdom, we, we, we were, we're excited, but we're not willing to, again, repent, change the way we think, and look at the difference and the distinction between these, what the world is preaching and what the word preaches about love, about happiness, about success. And therefore, what happens is we jump onto the, we begin to follow Jesus. We begin to follow him. And all, all of a sudden, we, we might lose certain friendships. Or we might lose certain amount of finances because we've chosen to do s- certain things. Or we might lose a certain, you know, to some degree, we might lose, again, uh, people might talk about us in a negative way or a different way. And all of a sudden, as Jesus, he refers to it as the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. It begins to choke you out, it begins to choke the life out of you. It begins to choke your, that, that fire that you have for the Lord. All of a sudden, the oxygen is taken out. Of that, of that, of your, of your life, because you begin to, again, you're, you're deceived by these things. You want, you, you see that, you see all the losses that you might be having, and you miss out. You're not, you don't see the true joy in it. You don't see the true reward at the that, that the Lord is offering, and what the end of the story is going to look like. You don't see that it's worth it. And all of a sudden, the life gets choked out of you. Have you ever just felt like that as a, as a, a follower of Christ, where you just feel choked? You just feel like that you're trying to, to keep that fire going. But there's so many other things that are, are distracting and pulling your attention away. That's the thorny response. And the worthy response that Jesus tells. And again, you can read through the rest of this in Matthew 13. Because Jesus, what happens is Jesus tells us parable and his disciples ask him, like, hey, dude, what, why, are you, why are you all of a sudden speaking in stories? I mean, that's my paraphrase. But they say, why, why are you speaking in parables? Why, we, don't, we don't get what you're saying. And, he, and that's when Jesus tells them, I'm, I'm telling them, I'm, because the hearts of the people have grown dull. And I want to get to the heart. I want to expose some things in you. I want to expose some things in the people that are following me because I want you closer to me. I want you to see that there is more that I've giving, I'm giving to you. There's more that is that I want you. I want you to be fruitful. I want to give. I want to put seed into your life. I don't just do it so that you can look good. I want to put fruit in your life. I want to sow seed in your life so there can be fruit. There can be these things coming out of you. The worthy response is again this. It's the one who hears, has ears to hear, who, who the seed falls on the ground and he yields a crop. He responds. It's, a wor- it's worthy because it's, it's appropriate. It's the appropriate response. It's a seed that is sown on good ground. It's a seed that produces ex- extraordinary crop. It yields tenfold, hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. And that means, you know, some of us, some of us, our, our response, we might, my fruitfulness might look f- different than your fruitfulness. But it's about being fruitful. It's about producing fruit. I want some, some, it says some 100 fold, some 60 fold, some 30 fold. I'm not going to get, I, I shouldn't get upset at someone who's, who's seeking to obey the Lord wholeheartedly. They're, but they're, they only got 30 fold fruit, and this person over here has 100 fold fruit. We don't need to get in the business of measuring whose fruit is better. It's are you producing fruit? Are you, are you moving forward? Are you taking ground?
Jesus commended all who received the message regardless of the me- their measure of productivity. It's, it's, it was either good or bad fruit, right? Jesus talks about it being either good fruit or bad fruit. The measure of your productivity, that I want, I want more of productivity and of fruit both internally in my character but also externally in my, in my actions and my words and my doings. But the, product, the measure of it is not what Jesus is evaluating. It's, is it, are, you, are you producing and is it good? Is it good fruit? Is it the real deal? Just to leave you guys with this, because I, I want to get this across tonight, this idea of, of responding to the word of the kingdom in the right way and what, what that looks like. There's a story that, that is told in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. And it says this, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. And then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows, and then he said to the king of Israel, put, out, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window. He opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he, sh- and he shot. And he said, the, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians of Aphek till you have destroyed them. And then he said, take the arrows. So he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six, six times, and then you would have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you strikes you will strike Syria only 3 times so he was mad at him because he didn't he didn't again he didn't fully give himself to, he didn't his response rather he was mad at him because of his response to what he was told and you might read this at first glance and be like whoa i mean you didn't tell him how many times i mean you just gave him an arrow and just told him to shoot out the window and told him to hit the ground i mean i could imagine joe ash like you know you know, it sounds crazy. Like, we're, because this is what's going on. Israel is under attack. This is why he's coming to Elisha, who's the prophet, who'd been, who, who's been known to do all these miracles, and he's been a prophet to Israel. And Joash is coming for help. He's like, what do we do? What do we do? And, jo, and, and it's, it sounds crazy. What do we do? Elisha says, hey, shoot this arrow out the window. Hit it on the ground. Hit these arrows on the ground. Three, you know, strike them on the ground. Strike the ground. And Joash is like thinking. I mean, he's kind of haphazardly like, okay, like sounds kind of weird. But he doesn't. He just kind of does it. Kind of goes through the motions. But he's not giving him. He doesn't fully take Elisha's words seriously. What that what that indicates, and what we can see here is, first off, Elisha. Tells him to shoot the arrow out the window over the land because it's, a, again, it's a declaration to say, hey, the battle, first off, you got to take, in any battle, you got to take the high ground. You got to take the air first. You, you have to win the battle in the heavenlies first. And that's through, through him, through God alone. Jesus, God goes before us into the battle. And that's kind of the indication there is that he, he wanted. Joash to understand that this is the Lord. The Lord's going to go before you into this. But you have to fully entrust him. You have to entrust what he's promised. And you have to see it. And then he said, hey, strike the ground. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And he, he puts the arrows in his hand. But Joash just gives this kind of half-hearted response. Like, hits it three times. Instead of fully contending, fully believing, fully taking and striking the ground and contending for all that, that was promised. He didn't take Elisha's words seriously. And so I think many times, I'll just end it with this question here. What, how do we respond to the arrows that we're given? How do God has put things in our hands. 
God has called us to respond to him in a certain way. He's, he's promised so many things. And if you think what we, you experience in Christianity right now and your own walk with him is all there is, is the best there is, then I, then I feel sorry <laughs> because there is so much more that, that is yet. Jesus, his first beatitude he teaches is that you, the blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who recognize there's a lack and there's more. There's more, and that we would contend for, that we would take ground, that we would contend for the more, we would respond, we would take his word seriously. When he says, he says in the last days my, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh, I want to believe that in its fullness. I don't want to just take that half, halfway. I don't want to just, you know, on a scale of one to ten, I don't want to just settle for a two. I want to see the ten. I want to see re revival. I want to see thousands and multitudes come to the Lord. In my family, in this city, I want to see healing as, the, as we, Jesus promised. These signs will follow those who believe. I want to see uh, the, these, the power of God moving in my life and in, in and around me. I want the word of the kingdom. I don't want to I, take it in a way where it's just, you know, just, okay, this is just, sounds silly, but I'll do it anyway. Just kind of halfway going through the motion. I want to, to take the ground that God has promised. Like he told Joshua, everywhere you shall tr your feet shall tread, I will give you that land. I will, you will have that land. If, if, you move, if you're going to hold on to my word and obey me, I will give you the ground you're walking on. I don't want to be a Christian who settles for that too. I want to go for the, the whole thing. I want to obey for more. I want to obey him with everything. I don't. I don't want to just make up a compromise. And that doesn't mean I'm. Per, I'm going to get this perfect every day of my life. And that doesn't mean I'm an inspired every day of my life. But it's. I want it to be in my so deep in me that I, that when I stray, I come back. When I fall, I get up because I have a something in me that says there's, there's more to this. I want to take the ground that he's given me. Something as a Christian that we have to understand is these arrows of deliverance that he gives us. He's promised us. He, he, if, you're not, if, you don't, if, if you're not willing to take what he's given you, then you, then you lose it altogether. And that was what he said in the, that was what he goes on to say in the parable that we were just in. To, one, to the one who has, more will be given. And to the one who doesn't have, what he does have will be taken away. And you read that and you're like, well, that's harsh. But what he's saying there is he says, hey, I'm putting stuff, I'm only going to give to the one who wants and the one who takes ground and one who actually responds to what I'm giving him. Those who are, I, I've read a book a long while ago by Leonard Ravenhill called Why Revival Tarries. And it says the people, <laughs> the, whole, the whole, you know, there's all these articles and powerful sayings in there, but the essence of it is, hey, revival tarries because we don't want revival. We don't really want it. <laughs> we don't see it because we don't, we're not, we don't, we don't really want it. We don't really want more of it. We just want all the, the glamour of it. We don't, but we don't want to sow the seed. How silly would it be for a farmer to have this big chop piece of land and just say, oh, one day I'm just, one day we're going to have a harvest. But he never spends forth the time to, to till the ground, to sow the seed, to weed, to, to sow the seed or pull the weeds. If we're not willing to sow the seed and pull the weeds, we will never see the harvest that we're called to see. Jesus says there is going to be a harvest. There's going to be great signs greater than these. There's going to be a, a harvest of souls coming to the kingdom, but there's not many workers there's not many laborers, not enough people who are responding or taking me seriously. They're taking the time to, the time to sow the seed when, when it's hard and difficult. It doesn't look like it makes much sense. In my own personal life, if I'm not taking ground, if I'm not moving forward and taking ground, I'm moving backwards. There's no in-between. You can't just hit a cruise control in your walk with Jesus. It's, it's, it's not possible. You either go forward or backwards. And you, if you're in here this morning, or this evening rather, and you're watching from home and you've, you know that and you're, to be true in your own life, <laughs> you, you hit the cruise control and, and you just think, okay, I don't want to, I can't commit or do this or do that. And 
you don't want to, you can't, you're just kind of in this in-between place. And you fr- it fr- it's frustrating. It's frustrating because you want more. There's, your soul wants more, but your flesh is, is wanting other things. And you got to make up your mind. That's where your a mind over matter thing comes into play. That's where a resolute res- resolution in your spirit needs, needs to rise up and say, I, want, I need to take ground today. I need to take ground for my family. I need to take ground for this church, even if it's just me. Is that all right? <laughs> you guys can stand. About out of time here. I'm thankful for y'all being here. I'm thankful for those tuning in. And I, my prayer, we're just going to pr- just end in prayer here. And I just, uh, just really feel just in my spirit that, you know, th- I just kept hearing that same word today, just even today, just take, keep taking ground. <laughs> like just that, I, just that, that phrase has been in my spirit, keep taking ground. When you, f- like, e- in the season of failure, even, when you, when you feel like you failed in a lot of different areas, keep taking ground. Keep, keep sowing that seed. Keep, receive, keep moving forward. Don't give, in it, don't give that, that ground back to the enemy. I imagine a football team or a, a basketball team who only play defense. I mean, you don't... Yeah, imagine getting an interception in a football game and then you just kind of stop and you just kind of take a kneel and put it, give it back to their team because you want to play defense. You want to protect what you got. Oh, we got the ball. Let's, let's, let's play defense. Or you get the ball and you just take a knee. <laughs> I always get mad at teams that take knees when they shouldn't. But you, that's the same way I believe a lot of us have lived out or living in our place of Christianity and our walk with Jesus where we are... We are so afraid of, we've gotten to a certain place and we're so afraid of losing some things that, that we've got. That we play defense and we just kind of just set up, set up camp where we're at. And we don't, we're not willing to take any more risks. We're not willing to take, enough, take more ground because we, we got to a certain place. And it's comfortable there. We got, we got a, a comfortable to, at that place. But I believe today is the day that some of you need to say, hey, I, I'm going to get back on the offensive. I need to get back on the offensive in my personal life, for my family, again, for our church, for the body of Christ, to be on the offense, to move forward in these things. Lord, I, I just want to pray, Father, I just pray right now for those in this, this room tonight, and those at home, those driving, those hearing this, God, that you would just speak to their hearts right now, God. Give them courage, Lord. Give them courage, Jesus, to say yes to you, God. Those that think, those that are afraid of letting go of some, some certain things, are afraid of uh, turning away from these things, or getting out of a place of comfort, God, they're afraid because it's, it seems on the front end, it seems too costly. God, I pray, Lord, that you would give them courage to take these risks, God, that they would see the worth of Jesus. They would see, God, the, the joy of, of, of taking these, taking ground, of taking steps forward, of responding to the word of the kingdom, not just with joy in one moment, but day by day responding to you with, with full faith in our heart. God, I pray for those that are, have written themselves off because of shame, because of failure, those that have put themselves out of the game, taken themselves out of the game because of failure. I just pray that you give them courage to, to get back up tonight, to get back in tonight, God. In Jesus' name, I pray for healing. I pray for your, your mercy, Jesus. We thank you for your, your grace and your mercy that we can say yes again, and you're there. Amen and amen.